Welcome this afternoon. It's a pleasure to have you here in the chapel. As you know, this has been a long process of bringing a beautiful crucifix to our chapel. We're very indebted, indebted to, Peter, to Peter Legge and to the Board of Trustees for all the hard work they've done in bringing us a beautiful piece of art. Uh, being on campus, we have a work of art that's part of the art of the university now. And I'm just delighted that Jock Reynolds, the curator from the Yale University Art Gallery, is here to say a few words about religious art on Yale's campus, of which this is a part. Welcome, Jock Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Father Bob. It's indeed an honor to be with you all today on this particularly happy occasion after all the deliberation and work that's gone into the commissioning of this beautiful new crucifix by Giuseppe Marianello. I want you to just look around today and, and in future visits to this beautiful chapel and see how beautifully this new crucifix exists visually with the great stations of the cross commissioned by Robert Amandello, which was done 75 years ago. Think of that, the gap between these two artists and how beautifully they resonate visually in this place of worship. I wanted to say that religious art at Yale has been very much on my mind this last week, especially so with much of the publicity you may have been reading about the American, great American Monument Men, uh, the great film documenting their exploits of saving the Nazi looted art of Europe, debuted last night here in uh, New Haven. And for the last week, we've had Robert Edsel, the author of the book that created that movie here amongst us, because 13 of the Monument Men, in fact, were Yale faculty members, curators or directors of the Yale Art Gallery and the education that they received here at this university amidst great religious art collections, and that that many students up at Harvard also received, formed the group of the great majority of the men who volunteered for service in Europe and went throughout Europe toward the end of the war, identifying and returning ultimately more than three and a half million artworks that were looted by the Nazis, uh, many of which were returned to their rightful churches, their rightful museums, and in some cases, the survivors of families to whom they once belonged. Um, it's really an amazing moment to think of what is really here at this great university to be enjoyed as you study uh, both religious art and you worship here in this community. I just want to mention that beyond the art gallery itself, one could walk over to the Beinecke Library. They're on view, always in their public galleries, as one of the great examples of the Gutenberg Bible. One can go into their collection as a researcher, any one of you, and look at some of the most beautiful illuminated manuscripts ever created that are here at this university. You can go over to the Sterling Library and in the record listening room, here's some of the greatest religious music that's ever been recorded. You can also come over <clears throat> to the art gallery after perhaps going to a concert or two at the Institute for Sacred Music on our campus and look at the, some of the great books of ours, the prayer books that exist in our collection and our prints, drawings, and photographic collections. But perhaps most importantly of all, you can visit our early European galleries. And Yale, I should say, was particularly blessed to have the first great collections of Italian Renaissance art come to this university way back in 1871. The Jarvis Collection came here to Yale. That was one year even before the Metropolitan Museum was founded. The Yale Art Gallery was actually founded in 1832, 40 years before the Metropolitan. Then again in 1943, during the height of World War II, uh, the great Griggs Collection was actually divided evenly between Yale and the Metropolitan. Later in 1956, the great Rabinowitz Collection of Italian Renaissance art was given to Yale. And since then, new acquisitions of, of great religious art, particularly Italian Renaissance art, have been made in successive years ever since. So you literally have some of the greatest art one could hope to, to see right here on this university campus. And all of it, I'm happy to say, is available to you free of charge. You don't have to pay a cent to walk in and enjoy these resources anymore that you have to pay, and pay to come in and worship here in this beautiful chapel. I just wanted to mention, since uh, things are free at the Art Gallery and acquisitions have gone on, that just in very recent last two or three years, some very important new works have come into the collection. A beautiful gilt bronze uh, crucifixion by Camilla Ruschini from the 17th century that parallels beautifully with this work is now on view in one of our galleries. The great Louis Cranich, the elder, 16th century uh, altarpieces there. The crucifixion and the uh, converted centurion, it's called. It's one of the great old master works. 
Uh, more recently, Anibali Karachi's great 16th century work was given by Richard Feigen, one of our Yale alums from the class of 1952, whose collection is shown at Yale, and we're hopeful may all come to Yale as these earlier collections did by gift or bequest. And uh, also thinking of religious ceremonies and processions themselves, uh, the, uh, very recently we acquired the Luis de Morales uh, Christ Carrying the Cross. This is actually a very large painting, the kind that were literally carried in processions throughout Europe and particularly in Spain on large banners through the towns and into the churches. So we now have one of those for your enjoyment. And we also have the first and only major work by Benedetto Bonfili outside of Italy here, which is a great triptych of Christ crowned with thorns, Christ carrying the cross and the crucifixion. All of these are in the gallery for you to see and enjoy, and frankly, there will be others. Now, one thing I want to mention about places of worship and imagery is back in the days that many of these works were made, in particular the great 13th and 14th century works that exist in the gallery and even beyond, Congregations such as this, for the most part, could not read nor write. They were illiterate. They counted on their priests to explicate the Bible and the text to them. So as you look around even today and think of the Stations of the Cross, for example, think of the power that imagery had for people who could not read or write, but had to have the Bible spoken to them, interpreted to them. They had to line out the Psalms, repeat, and learn language and learn stories. But images have always been crucial to a religious understanding. And we all know, since it's what we do most with our, our eyes is to see our way through the world, that these images will have great important to all of, import to all of you, uh, regardless of whether we live in now a very literate global community. So I just want, on this very happy occasion, encourage you to come to this place often, which now has wonderful art. And we've added to it a great work by Jane Doggett, the 23rd Psalm sculpture, that again is a work explicated by images. When you know that Psalm, you can walk in and see image after image. It'll take you through the Psalm. And enjoy these things as you worship and as you also study the great religious traditions of our civilization. Thank you and enjoy this great time together today. Thank you for that. Please, as is our tradition here, please rise and greet your neighbor and join us in our opening song found in your programs.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. As I welcome you all here this afternoon, in a special way, I welcome the Board of Trustees who are here for their winter meeting. And it's a pleasure to welcome Archbishop Blair for his first visit here to the chapel. Archbishop, welcome to the Board of Trustees and welcome to St. Thomas More. Thank you. Thank you. My brothers and sisters, as we gather for this liturgy this evening, we do so as always under the sign of the cross in the form of the beautiful crucifix that will be blessed during the course of this liturgy, and also under the sign of the tabernacle. The cross recalls what God has done for us, what Christ has done for us, and the tabernacle recalls what he continues to do for us and the fact that he is with us in this sacred liturgy and at every moment of our lives. So as we begin, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. Lord Jesus, you came to gather the nations into the peace of God's kingdom. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you come in word and sacrament to strengthen us in holiness. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you will come in glory with salvation for your people. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Keep your family safe, O Lord, with unfailing care, that relying solely on the hope of heavenly grace, they may be defended always by your protection. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. 
A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, Share your bread with the hungry, shelter the oppressed and the homeless, clothe the naked when you see them, and do not turn your back on your own. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your wound shall be quickly healed. Your vindication shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove from your midst oppression, false accusation, and malicious speech, if you bestow your bread on the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, then light shall rise for you in the darkness, and the gloom shall become for you like midday. The word of the Lord. rises in the darkness, a light for the upright. A light rises in the darkness, a light for the upright. They are lights in the darkness for the upright. They are generous, merciful, and just. Good people take pity and lend. They conduct their affairs with honor. A light rises in the darkness. A light for the upright. The just will never waver. They will be remembered forever. They have no fear of evil news. With firm hearts they trust in the Lord. A light rises in the darkness. Steadfast hearts they will not fear. Open handed they give to the poor. Their justice stands firm forever. Their heads will be raised in glory. A light rises in the darkness. A light A reading from 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. I have announced to you the mystery of Christ crucified. When I come to you, brothers and sisters, proclaiming the mystery of God, I did not come with sublimity of words or of wisdom, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my message and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with demonstration of spirit and power, so that your fight, faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. The word of the Lord. Oh, uh-huh. 
Rejected becomes the cornerstone chosen. Praise the work of God for this marvel in our eyes. Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so your light must shine before others that they may see the good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. Gospel of the Lord. First, let me say how very happy I am to be with all of you uh, for this evening's uh, special Mass and to congratulate uh, Father Boulogne and the board and all of you on successfully bringing such a beautiful project to completion in the form of the crucifix that I will be blessing uh, in just a few moments. And certainly the effort and the time that was put into making this uh, selection and this choice are, have been uh, very successful and are, is a very fitting uh, crucifix for a chapel of this kind and for the worship of Almighty God. I hope, I don't want to invite myself because that wouldn't be proper, but I hope there'll be some occasion uh, in the coming year or so that I might make a return visit and have a chance to interact with some of the students perhaps a question and answer session or just a discussion session, but I would very much welcome that. Um, and I think that's an important part of my responsibility uh, as uh, Archbishop to be with you. And I wanna to pledge to Father Boulogne and to all of you that I will do whatever I can to be of pastoral assistance to you and to pray with you and for you uh, here uh, in New Haven. Uh, last Sunday, we observed the feast of the presentation of the Lord. And you'll recall the gospel of that day. In accordance with Jewish law, the infant Jesus was presented in the temple. And as a result, the temple was filled with spiritual light. It is the light of Christ shining in the darkness of this world. And every time we come here, as we do this evening, we see a very particular symbol of that light. And it's particular because it can be found in every Catholic church. Sometimes it is very ornate, sometimes it's relatively simple, as the one I'm going to point out to you, but it 
is above my left shoulder here on the wall, and that is the sanctuary lamp. The sanctuary lamp near the tabernacle in which the blessed sacrament is reserved. And I think the sanctuary lamp provides us with an image that helps us to understand our Lord's words about light as reflected in today's liturgy. In the gospel, Jesus says that we are not only the salt of the earth and a city set on a mountain. He also says, you and I are the light of the world through what we do and through what we are. Now, if you stop and think, we might ask, how can this be? How can we be the light of the, of the world? And I think the answer calls for understanding and discretion. Because left to ourselves, we are fallen creatures. We are incapable of doing anything worthy of salvation. We're hardly a spectacle of light for ourselves, much less for the world. Even the best of us and the best of our intentions and our human good works are feeble, flawed, earthbound, and destined to die. We really have no light of our own, no power of our own to transform and save a sinful world. Left unaided, nothing of earth rises to the holiness and the splendor and the majesty of God. I'm reminded of the medieval English mystic Julian of Norwich, something she said that once she was given a, a vision of a little round thing the size of a hazelnut that was placed in her hand in this vision. She wondered what it might be, and the answer was given to her that it was all that is, that is made. It represent, represented all of creation. And she marveled, how could this possibly last, this small, fragile little thing? And a voice spoke to her understanding and said, it lasteth and ever shall, for God loves it. It lasteth and ever shall, for God loves it. Now you and I know in faith, my brothers and sisters, that the love of God has been revealed to the world. It's been revealed to that little frail chestnut of being. And that love has a name, and the name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ crucified, as St. Paul says in our second reading, reveals the wisdom and the power of God in the midst of that hazelnut's being. It is the light of Christ that overcomes the darkness of sin and death, that obscures the truth and the grandeur of our being. With this in mind, I ask you to reflect on the gospel and the sanctuary lamp. Think of it, it is a light because of two things that are united as one. First, the transparent glass container, and second, the fire within. And that, my friends, is the way it must be with us and with Christ. You might say we are that transparent glass, and Christ is the light within us. That, I think, is the humble lesson of the sanctuary lamp. Our life's vocation is to let Christ's life fill us more and more, to make room for it, to give wider space in our hearts to its infinite brightness. And we do this by expelling all that is not Christ within us, all that is darkness, all that is sin. The less Christ is present, the weaker the light that shines forth from us, and the more he is present, the stronger the light. And that is why our goodness does not redound to our praise, but as Jesus says, to the praise of our Heavenly Father. The Father is praised and the Father is glorified by Christ's perfect and loving light, which first shone in his earthly life 
and now shines forth in each one of us. Our good works are essential, but they cannot of themselves save the world. Only if Christ is living within us do our good works become his and his become ours, like a single lamp shining for the salvation of the world. What are the works of Christ? The first reading this evening gives us many examples. Sharing your bread with the hungry, sheltering the homeless, satisfying the afflicted, clothing the naked, not turning your back on your own, doing away with oppression, false accusation, and malicious speech. If we do these Christ-like things, Isaiah prophesies, then the light shall rise for you in the darkness, he says, and the gloom shall become for you like midday. Every day, in ways both great and small, we are either re accepting or rejecting divine invitations to be a light and to spread the light in the world. So we must ask ourselves this evening, am I allowing Christ to shine in me to light up the world's darkness? And if I'm not, am I willing to be changed? Am I willing to crucify the darkness within myself to use Paul's imagery? so that Christ can shine? Or do I blame the darkness on others or sometimes even try to blame God? So my brothers and sisters, let us pray that we will, as the saying goes, light a candle rather than curse the darkness. Let us pray that we will be imitators of Christ, not just in words, but in deeds, so that seeing Christ's goodness in our acts people may give praise to our Father who is in heaven. And join with me now in the prayer of blessing for this crucifix. <clears throat> My dear brothers and sisters, we are here to bless a new cross for this beautiful chapel. Let us venerate in faith the eternal plan by which God has made the cross of Christ the preeminent sign of his mercy. As we look upon the cross, let us call to mind that on it, Christ brought to completion the sacrament of his love for the church. As we bow before the cross, let us remember that in his own blood, Christ has removed all divisions and out of the many nations created the one people of God. As we venerate the cross, let us reflect that we are ourselves Christ's disciples and must therefore follow him, willingly taking up our own cross each day. Let us then take part with all our hearts in this blessing, that we may grasp the mystery of the cross and its light more clearly and experience its power more deeply. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord God, Father all holy, for your boundless love, the tree once the source of shame and death for humankind, has become the cross of our redemption and life. When his hour had come to return to you in glory, the Lord Jesus, our King, our priest, and our teacher, freely mounted the scaffold of the cross and made it his royal throne, his altar of sacrifice, his pulpit of truth. On the cross, lifted above the earth, he triumphed over our age-old enemy, 
Clothed in his own blood, he drew all things to himself. On the cross, he opened out, opened out his arms and offered you his life, the sacrifice of the new law that gives to the sacraments their saving power. On the cross, he proved what he had prophesied, the grain of wheat must die to bring forth an abundant harvest. Father, we honor this cross as the sign of our redemption. May we reap the harvest of salvation planted in pain by Christ Jesus. May our sins be nailed to his cross, the power of life released, pride conquered, and weakness turned to strength. May the cross be our comfort in trouble, our refuge in the face of danger, our safeguard on life's journey, until you welcome us to our heavenly home. Grant this through Christ our Lord. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. God, our loving Father, has given us the victory of the cross to bring us from death to life through his beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Confident of God's eternal and loving mercy for us, let us offer him now our needs, the needs of all the church, and the needs of all those who are suffering in the world. Christ Jesus, you humbled yourself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Grant that your servants may imitate your obedience and know patient endurance during difficulties. For this we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Christ Jesus, at your name, every knee in heaven, on earth, and under the earth will bend in adoration. Draw all people to your heart so they will honor and adore you in faith. For this we pray. Lord, Christ Jesus, you established your church on the faith of Peter. Give your church continued vitality under the leadership of Pope Francis, shepherd of the Universal Church, and Archbishop Blair, shepherd of the local church in Hartford. For this we pray. 
Lord, hear our prayer. Christ Jesus, you came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we might know the fullness of your life within us. For this we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Christ Jesus, you invited the little children to come to you. On this national day of prayer to end human trafficking, may we all become ever more committed to securing the dignity of every person. For this we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Christ Jesus, in you we find the promise of eternal life. <coughs> Welcome our beloved dead into the radiance of your presence. For this we pray. Lord, and for your intentions. Lord, hear our Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, from your Son's wounds on the cross poured forth streams of light and life. Help us by the power of your grace to become the light of Christ in the world today, and grant the good things that we ask in his name, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever.
brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. O Lord, our God, who once established these created things to sustain us in our frailty, grant, we pray, that they may become for us now the sacrament of eternal life. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for in you we live and move and have our being. And while in this body, we not only experience the daily effects of your care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Spirit, through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. And so with all the angels, we praise you, as in joyful celebration we acclaim. are indeed holy, O Lord, <clears throat> and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. <clears throat> Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until we come again. 
Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us <clears throat> an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Thomas More, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth. With your servant Francis, our Pope, and Leonard, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you and are passing from this life, Give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of Christ's peace.
Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. O God, who have willed that we be partakers in the one bread and the one chalice, grant us, we pray, so to live that made one in Christ, we may joyfully bear fruit for the salvation of the world. Through Christ our Lord. The presence of this chapel and its life is a blessing not only for all of you and the local community here at the university, but certainly for all of us in the Archdiocese of Hartford. And I'm very happy to be with you today. And uh, I look forward, as I say, to other times in the future. I also want to congratulate all of you on the completion of this beautiful crucifix. And uh, when you come in and kneel before it, if you say a prayer for the Archbishop, that would be appreciated too, <laughs> as I begin my new ministry. People have been so wonderfully kind to me, but I say, you know, I haven't done anything to get anybody angry at me yet. <laughs> bishops, bishops have a way of getting in trouble sometimes, but I do thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. The Lord be with you. Bow down for the blessing. May the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended. <laughs>